Well, good morning. Hope you guys had a great Thanksgiving. We certainly did. We had a house full of people. We had a house full of little people. I'm tired. The dogs are tired. Um, but it was a wonderful Thanksgiving. I, um, I want to pause for just a second and take care of a uh, piece of business because I want to make sure that we avoid some confusion. Uh, on the South Ward project, which I'm so excited about, I don't know if you guys, I was not able to hear Jordan's announcement, but I don't know if you remember, a lot of these children get nothing for Christmas. And um, Christmas is a bad day for them. And so we are going to make sure that every child in that school get something for Christmas this year. Um, but the way it actually is working is you will go out uh, to the desk and, and where the Christmas trees are, and you'll pick up an ornament, and when you bring that ornament back, that's when it will go on the tree, uh, when you bring back the gift associated with that ornament. So, uh, And then once all the ornaments are on there, they we will light up the tree. And the reason that's important is because if you go out there and think we're taking ornaments off the tree and you see there are no ornaments on the tree, you will think there is nothing for you to do. And that's not true. Got plenty for you to do. You guys like that hymn, Holy, Holy, Holy? That is, um, that is my favorite hymn. You can play that, sing that at my funeral. Um, and uh, I love that hymn. Because the word holy really is saying that God is unique. There is no one and nothing that can even remotely compare to our God. And the line in the hymn that says, Though the darkness hide thee, is a reminder that there are times in life that we wonder, where is God? But even in the midst of those seasons, in the midst of those times, our God is holy and at work and present. And that is very much where we end up today in Micah. This is our final sermon in the Micah series. And as we've said from the beginning, Micah's name literally means who is like God? And the point of the book is that no one is like God. And unfortunately, the people of his day were just like the people of our day, and they found plenty of things, plenty of idols to put at the center of their life and to take God's place. And the result was corruption, confusion, evil, from the top of the country, from the highest leaders, all the way down to the people. And Micah comes with a message to Israel and Judah. Remember, they're divided kingdoms at this point. And he says, God is going to respond to your corruption. He is going to deal with what you are doing as my people. And so as we've seen each week, the book of Micah really divides into three different cycles that kind of repeat themselves Starting in Micah 1, you have a cycle of judgment. Then evidence is presenting to support that judgment, but then Micah 2 ends with hope. There will be restoration. The second cycle repeats the same pattern. There is judgment and evidence in Micah 3, and then in Micah 4, we have a message of hope. And we're in the final cycle, which is started with judgment in Micah 6. And then last week, Slade took us into the lament that the prophet Micah has as he weeps and grieves over the state of the nation, but ends his lament with the word of hope that God is our salvation. And this morning, that thought gets developed, and the book ends with our saving God. Now, I've used the word idol a lot in this series, and I want to take a second and just think about that word. What comes to your mind? You don't have to say it out loud. That might be chaotic. But what comes to your mind when you think of the word idol? Very often what comes to our mind is something that we worship. And that's a good start. 
But remember, the people worshiped idols for a particular reason. An idol is anything that you use to achieve control over an uncontrollable world, usually with the goal that you will either feel important or you will feel safe. An idol is what you use to bring control over an uncontrollable world to help you feel important or safe. Now, back in their day, being safe meant things like a good harvest. And of course, they couldn't control the weather to ensure good crops, so what did they do? They would try to control the person they thought controlled the weather. And so they built a statue, and they would sacrifice a small woodland creature, and, um, and they would think, okay, well, that's good for us. It's bad for the squirrel, but it's good for us. The most common idols in the book of Micah were wealth and power. No woodland creatures were harmed, but it was still idolatry. They used wealth and power to control their world, to feel important, to feel safe. And that kind of idolatry is still with us today. I've shared several times and will continue to share with you that possibly my biggest idol, one of my biggest idols at least, is approval. And here's how it works. I want to feel valuable. I want to feel like I matter. And when I think that you approve me, of your approval of me is what's going to make me important, make me matter, make me valuable, then that approval has become an idol. And you know what the problem is? Approval comes and goes. Approval will come and go every day, every week, and so I always am a slave to trying to get more. And when I'm in that mode, I have to watch what I say so I don't lose your approval. I have to watch what I do so I don't lose your approval. And guess what? If your idol is wealth or power or applause or achievement, you are going to be a slave to those things in exactly the same way. Micah ends the book by giving us the only basis upon which well-being can be based. The only basis for hope and well-being that will never enslave us, that will never let us down, and that is the character of God. And in these closing verses of Micah, we see four distinct paragraphs, each with an important message. No one is like the God who supports his people when they deserve judgment. No one is like the God who transforms his people into something beyond their greatest hopes. No one is like the God who pursues an intimate relationship with his people. And no one is like the God who never fails. The first section opens with the truth that God supports his people through judgment. In verse 8, Micah is so completely identifying with God's people that he keeps saying I or me when he actually means all of Israel and Judah. Micah commands his enemies to stop gloating. It's interesting that the first command that we come across is actually a command to the enemies. You see, whatever bad might have happened to Israel, God is going to undo it. If their enemies knock them down, God is going to raise them up. If Israel is confused, if Israel is in darkness, God is going to rescue them. In verse 9, Micah says that he is going to accept God's punishment. Again, speaking for the people, knowing that God will, allow, will also become his defender. The word that's translated indignation is a word for rage. Micah recognizes that the people deserve God's rage because of their sin. But even in his rage, God is not against them. At some point, God's role shifts, and he becomes the defense attorney, and he pleads the people's case. And when it says that God executes judgment in this verse, the idea is that God is going to be just. He is going to discipline his people to exactly the right amount and then vindicate them. God is not against them. He's going to vindicate them. God is a defense attorney who will defend them, and he will be the judge who will free them. They will never be able to say of God 
that you were unfair. When God vindicates his people, their enemies will be put to shame. That's really what verse 10 is saying. These enemies used to say to Israel that God doesn't exist. They used to say that they're going to crush Israel and Judah. And the point is that a day is going to come when everyone who threatened God's people, everyone who taunted God's people will look back on that moment and they will be embarrassed that they ever said those things and did those things. God's people were in a situation where they were in darkness, where the holiness of God seemed to be hidden. And they were in that situation because they had turned their back on God, pursued idolatry, and especially the idolatry of wealth and power. And God steps in and says, enough. Enough of the corruption. Enough of the idolatry. But the point of this passage The point of this paragraph is that God doesn't intend to wipe out his people. He disciplines them exactly to the right and appropriate amount, but God supports them through that discipline. And the point of the discipline is not to eliminate them, not to crush them, it's to purify them so they will stand vindicated before the Lord and everyone who told them that God had abandoned them. You've probably figured this out by now. Um, If you haven't, let me just put this right out there on the table. I live every single day on the precipice of disaster. I live every day inches away from massive clothing mishaps. That's because I'm colorblind. Who here remembers Garanimals? Garanimals were great. Apparently, they started making them again in 2008. I looked this up. It's kind of excited. You can go to Walmart. Garanimals are great. The idea is that you would have different animals for each piece of clothing. So if the animal on the shirt matched the animal on the pants, the clothes went together. I am waiting for someone to come up with adult Garanimals. In the meantime, I have my wife which um, usually works pretty well. I'll ask her, does this go together? And she'll say yes, and then she smiles. (laughs) And I'm left to interpret that smile. See, the problem with being colorblind is that I can't see what's really there. And my fear is that we have a certain type of spiritual colorblindness that causes us to miss what Isaiah is saying. We live in a world, we live in a culture that is constantly telling us that our acceptance is based on our performance. We only make the team if we're athletic enough. If we aren't talented enough, we're not going to make the band or the choir. If we aren't attractive enough, we're not going to get the date. We turn that then into a spiritual colorblindness that says, if I'm not good enough, God is going to reject me. We read Micah and we think that's exactly what he's saying. God is rejecting his people because of their idols. But this paragraph is exposing this as spiritual colorblindness. God's judgment isn't to reject his people, it is to fix his people. God will sustain them through that process. They will get to the other side and they're going to stand vindicated by God, not because of what they have done, but because of what God has done for them. How much more is that the case with us? Romans 8 promises us there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Why? Because as a follower of Christ, God looks at you and he sees the perfect righteousness of his son. No matter what you have done. God is not working in his life, in your life to reject you. He is working to make you into the exact person that he sees when he looks at you. A reflection of Jesus and his character. So every time that voice goes off in your head that says, I really blown it again. God must think I'm a total loser. Stop yourself and replace that thought with a prayer of thanksgiving. Thank you, Father, for sustaining me while you make me like Christ. God sustains his people even as he disciplines them 
in order to make them like Jesus. And just like he promised the people of Micah's time, a day is going to come when our struggle with idols will be over. Whatever it is that constantly tempts you, that relentlessly calls on you, that you constantly fight and struggle to not give in to, someday that struggle is going to be over. And that's what leads to the next paragraph. See, the point of verses 11 through 13 is that God transforms his people into greater glory. Greater than what? Greater than what they ever imagined. Greater than what they ever hoped for. God's discipline changes his people into something greater. When verse 11 talks about the walls, we immediately think of these giant defensive walls that go around a city. But that's actually not what the word that's used here refers to. The word that's used here refers to boundary markers that would designate someone's property. In other words, this is a promise that the nation's territory is going to increase. It's going to expand. It's going to grow. Verse 12 shows people from all over the earth coming into this expanded territory. It doesn't necessarily say who the people are, but it seems like it's the return of all the Jews who've been scattered all around the world as God has disciplined his people. And this is a picture of coming home. So I was thinking about this passage. I remember uh, it's a classic movie, which I'm not necessarily recommending, um, because I think I've only seen the TV versions. It's called Apocalypse Now. And... um, there is this one scene towards the beginning of the movie where one character is talking to another, both of them are soldiers, talking to another character. I think the second one is actually a very young Harrison Ford. Uh, And the first soldier says to Harrison Ford, I am really looking forward to going home, to leaving, I think they're actually in Cambodia, to leaving Cambodia and going back to the United States. And the second soldier looks at him and says, I went home, I came back, and the line that he uses is this, I have been home, and it is no longer there. And his point is that he has been through so much pain, so much tragedy, so much suffering, and he is now so different that he no longer fits at home. He no longer really has a home. Verse 11 and 12 promise that on the other side of the tragedy and suffering and the pain, the people are going to find a home, and it will be better than what they will imagine. It's expanded territory, which means there will be safety. There will be a greater buffer from the enemies. It means that there is room for growth. There will be more farmland, more land for livestock. A nation that is expanding its borders was a nation that was thriving they will go home and find that it is better than they remembered. Everything that they hoped that they would get from their idols, they will actually receive from the Lord. But it, again, will be greater and better than they had ever imagined. You realize that we experience this sort of thing all the time. We pursue lots of different idols to give us some vague sense of well-being. But God wants to remove those because he knows that there is greater joy in thinking like Jesus, in valuing what Jesus values, in treating people the way Jesus treats them, and in pursuing the purposes and priorities that Jesus had. That's what God is doing in our lives. He's giving us something greater. Verse 13, then, is a contrast. The nations, the people who opposed Israel and Judah, will become desolate. The word desolate refers to something that that is worse than a ghost town. It's a wasteland. It's a picture that would make people shudder. It's complete ruin. And we have a very dramatic picture of that going on in our society today. I grew up as a kid going to Paradise, California every year, often multiple times a year because I have family there. I can remember as a teenager 
going on long runs through the town, through the hills that are around the town. There are very particular stores that I can remember shopping at. I actually still have things in my home that I can point to and say, I bought that in Paradise, California. Paradise, California no longer is there. It is a wasteland because of the fire that has swept through Northern California. It is uninhabitable. That's the type of image that this word desolate would have conjured in the original audience. Israel kept wanting to be like the other nations, but God says, no, you don't. Look where this is going to lead. It doesn't lead to thriving. It leads to desolation. Israel wondered, is there going to be justice on the enemies that have taunted us, that have pushed us down? Are they going to get away with evil? And God says, they will not get away with evil. There will be justice. God is not just supporting his people until they get to the other side of discipline. God is changing his people, and he is changing their circumstance. God reunites his people. He expands their territory. He brings justice to the enemies. God sustains his people even as he disciplines them. And God actively changes his people, transforming them into something greater than they had ever imagined. And then the point of verses 14 and 17 is that God restores his intimacy with his people. Micah pictures God as a shepherd in verse 14. It's a shepherd who cares for and protects his people like they were a special loved flock. We can think of dwelling alone, as it mentions in this verse, like that's a negative thing, like God has abandoned them. But that's actually not what it's saying. What it's saying is that they alone are allowed by God to live in this wonderful, lush, garden-like setting. Bashan and Gilead were these incredible places, these flourishing, beautiful places that were used to raise sheep in the promised land. And Micah is appealing to God that he allow them to go back and flourish and live in the lands that he promised generations ago. And in verse 15, God responds to that appeal. A shift takes place. It's no longer Micah speaking. Now God speaks to his people. He promises that he will do for the people in Micah's time what he did for the people in Moses' time. It's not just that God's going to do miraculous things. He is going to make it evident. He is going to show miraculous things. No one will be able to deny that this is God at work on behalf of his people. And verse 16 shows the result on the surrounding nations. The nations will see who God is, and they will be ashamed. They will realize that their strength is nothing compared to God's power, and they will just be silenced. Verse 17 uses two pictures to show that. The graphic picture of licking dust means that they are humbled and bowing down in submission before the Lord. And the second picture is of the nations leaving their fortresses. The idea is when they have seen the Lord, they know that their fortresses don't matter. Walls and boundaries don't matter when faced with the Almighty God. You catch in every paragraph so far, there have been two groups of people that have been talked about. God's people and those who oppose God's people. In each paragraph, we see that these two groups have very different futures. God's people are going to flourish. God's enemies are going to meet justice. The key difference between the two groups is in this paragraph. God has an intimate relationship with his people. He shepherds them. He has history with them. Um, I'm not complaining about this, but we had three different Thanksgiving meals this year. That's, that's never a bad thing. We just kind of bounced around between different family on different days. No complaints. But in our Friday night Thanksgiving meal, I had an interesting conversation with someone who I'm really just starting to get to know. Um, and he kind of shared his story a little bit. He talked about a little what his meal had been like with his family the night before. And it had been really good, and he talked about how great the food was, but as he was unfolding this story, one of the things that he shared 
is that his family is deeply, deeply divided. Half of the family was not there. Half of the family has not spoken to the other half of the family probably close to 10 years. They are deeply divided. And I was thinking about that. So you're sharing the story. I thought, you know, it's a good reminder that Thanksgiving isn't really about the food. Unless there's apple pie. The food is really a way of celebrating what is far more important. The blessings God has given us, especially friends and family. Right, there'd be something really weird if someone filled up their plate with a bunch of food, went into their bedroom, locked the door, ate it, never talked to anyone, and came out and said, man, I had a great Thanksgiving. We would think something that's a little bit strange about that. We would think that somehow this person is missing the point. And how often do we miss the point with God? Right, we want everything in verses 8 through 13. We want to thrive and work in relationships. We want to know that we're cared for financially. We want our enemies to get justice. But do we want God? Do we want a daily, growing relationship with him? Do we want to be shepherded by him? Sometimes I think I just want what I get from God. And you know what? When I do that, I am treating God just like an idol. I'm saying, I'll sacrifice my money in an offering because what I really want is for you to bless me, God, financially. I'll say that I'll sacrifice my time in serving because what I really want from you, God, is health. I'll say that I'll go to church every Sunday Because what I really want from you, God, are good relationships with other people. Micah reminds us that the greatest blessing is not what God gives us. It's the fact that we get to be his people every day. And how does God relate to his people? He sustains them. He transforms them. He restores intimacy with them when it's severed. And then the book of Micah ends with this amazing, amazing testimony to God's character. How can they know that God is going to do these things and be this sort of God to them? Because of who God is. And God never, ever fails his people. The book of Micah ends where it begins. Verse 18 asks the question, who is a God like you? And the answer is no one. Stop and think about all the reasons that we have seen in Micah that he could give for saying that no one is like God. In chapter 1, we saw God, God striding across the earth, crushing mountains under his feet. In chapter 2, God brings justice against the politically powerful. In chapter 3, God God brings justice against the religiously powerful. In chapter 4, God overcomes every nation that opposes him. In chapter 5, God controls the future. He promises deliverance through the Messiah, which he ultimately fulfills in Jesus. In chapter 6, God judges the wicked with all creation as his witness. And then in the first part of chapter 7, we saw God has the ability to save even from the worst, the most corrupt forms of evil. That is a small taste of how Micah has pictured God. When we get to verse 18, Micah doesn't focus on any of those things. Micah focuses on something very specific that makes God unique. God is willing and he is able forgive your sins. God pardons iniquity. The terms that are used there refer to someone picking up a burden, lifting it, and carrying it away. And that's what God does with our sins and our guilt. 
for the sake of God's people, God moves beyond their transgressions. God doesn't stay angry. He delights in faithfully loving his people. Verse 19 carries on the same theme. But I want you to catch the last line. God will cast all their sins into the depths of the sea. Now that sounds impressive enough to us. I mean, we even have a better sense of the depth of the sea than they did. We know it's a very long way down. But you know what? Even with our understanding of the depths of the sea, it was still more impressive to them in their culture. Because when they thought about the depth of the sea, what they thought about was the place of the dead. What they thought about was God taking their transgressions, taking their sins, taking everything that had caused God to discipline them, and it's like he kills them. He removes their sins from the land of the living. They have no power over them anymore. They have no power to destroy their relationship with God. They have no power to destroy their own lives and to control their own lives. That's what he's saying when he's saying, I am tossing this into the depths of the sea. It's like they are dead and powerless. Verse 20 is saying that God is going to finish what he started. God promised from the beginning to love his people, to care for his people, to protect them, to use them in his plans, to provide for them. And the rebellion against God doesn't change that God will forgive them and what he will accomplish in them and through them and for them. God will do what he always said that he would do. Who is like God? Your life, just like in the days of Micah, is filled with voices. It's filled with voices telling you to center your life on them. And so our hope gets filled with things like wealth and influence and power, knowledge or talent, achievement, approval. Every one of them, every one of those things are idols that will enslave us. Everyone will demand that you keep working for more and more of the knowledge or talent or achievement or wealth or influence or approval. You're not sacrificing woodland creatures to those idols. What you are sacrificing is yourself. And every one of those idols is going to fail to deliver. None of them can be your hope because none of them are like God. Really, the point of this entire year's series of sermons comes down to this statement. The more we know who God is and what he is like, the more we know our hope and our well-being are secure in him. If you want to know how do we deal with the sin that is in our lives, how do we get freedom? If you want to know how do I help my children, how do I help my friends get freedom from what they are struggling with, the answer is, you help them to get to know God. You help them to get to know who he is. You don't just try behavior modification. You help them to replace the idol in their lives with the true God with whom nothing can compare. That's the point, really, of this passage. It's the point of the book of Micah. And it's been the point of our theme all year long. To know God is to know hope. Our hope is built on nothing less. Only the true God will respond to your failure by sustaining you, will transform you, will pursue greater intimacy with you. Only the true God will never fail you. 
It's just not in his character. The character of God is the character of our hope. How do we respond to that? We suggested four different responses. And again, as you know, on our bulletin, there's a place that you can mark off those responses and there's a tear off. and You can put those in the boxes in the foyer because we as a staff want to pray with you, encourage you as you seek to apply God's word. Four responses I've suggested is, is always I like to start with prayer because, again, our transformation is a work of God. It's not a work of our efforts. And so we go before the Lord in prayer and ask him to reveal his character in new ways. And I would encourage you to do that, especially this holiday season, as we move into Advent, as we start to celebrate the coming of Jesus, our Savior. May we know the character of God better. Again, don't try to live the Christian life in isolation. Use things like the questions that are provided to talk with someone, to share with someone, to grow and learn together. Each week, I encourage you to go back through this passage and look at what does the passage say about who God is, because underlying that exercise, that study, is the belief that the more you know who God is, the more you're going to fall in love with him, and the more you're going to become like him. And I would especially encourage you to do that in verses 18 through 20. Go through those verses and rewrite them in your own words. The reason I say that is if you go back and look carefully at those verses, what you find there is a list of character traits of God. It's a remarkable way for him to end this book. And go back and spend time engaging with those character traits to learn this is who your God is, and there is no one like him. We want to close this series and close this morning by going before the Lord. There is no one like him. So would you stand with me as we pray? And as we stand, I want to ask the prayer team to come forward. These folks are here to pray with you no matter what you're struggling with no matter what you're dealing with, but boy, they certainly want to pray with you. And they certainly want to introduce you to the God who is like no other. Let's pray. Father, we come before you. We are amazed and we are humbled. Lord, we come before you and we acknowledge that every single day, we pursue things, we pursue idols that we think will give our lives meaning, that we think will make us secure, that we think will make us valuable. But all they do is enslave us. And all they do is disappoint us. But Lord, you never do. You are at work to change us and transform us to be like your son. And Lord, help us to love him and love you beyond any idol that calls on our lives. And Lord, we ask for your help with that today and this week. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So here is your thought. It's really the only way we can end this series. There is no one like our God. So how do we leave here in light of that truth? We leave here committed to reflect his character to a world that desperately needs it. You are dismissed.